So up next, we have an academic feature on big data and marketing analytics uh, by Professor Praveen Kopale from Tuck School of Business. Professor Kopale's teaching and a research interests include marketing management, marketing research, pricing strategy, and new product development. In addition to his awards, research, and editorial accomplishments, Prof Professor Praveen is also a research director, internet marketing and pricing, at the Glassmayer McNamee Center for Digital Strategies and a faculty associate of William F. Ackmayer Center for Global Leadership, both at the Tuck School. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. You all can hear me well? And, then, and thank you so much for having me here to talk about uh, big data and marketing analytic, analytics. I thank the conference organizers and uh, ISB for uh, hosting this event. And uh, you know, this talk also sort of forced me to put together all the various things I've done in the, in, in the past few years um, and, and, and think of them through the lens of uh, big data and uh, analytics. And uh, I'll try to leave you know, a few minutes uh, open at the end. It's about 2.20. I'll go till probably 3.10 or so. I'll leave about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end, all right? Um, this is an uh, issue at HBR issue a uh, uh, year or so ago, and talked about how the next management revolution is actually in big data. And the previous uh, you know, revolution we've seen was probably in late 90s and early 2000s, the internet one. But, but now you know this is, is the era of, of, uh, of, of big data. And, um, and I think, you know, in my view, I think this is sort of the golden age of uh, big data and analytics. And if you look at Moneyball, you know, that actually uses uh, you know, uh, huge amounts of data on um, uh, players' sporting ability, in this particular instance is in baseball, and that, that looked at you know, um, how to, um, which, which players to hire, for example, and you know, uh, competing on analytics. And, and if you look at uh, even in, in politics, you know, um, uh, how uh, Obama won the election uh, in the first time around, you know, they, uh, they hired a lot of data geeks, actually, uh, housed in, in, a, uh, in an apartment in, in uh, Chicago and crunching through all these numbers to really figure out which zip codes they really have to target. So you know, that's, that, that's data analytics. Whether we like it or not, you know, uh, we're going to be faced with it, so might as well embrace, embrace it, right? Um, so what kind of capabilities that firms need? You know, I, I think about data and analytics as, you know, as an art and a science. The art part comes from the people, uh, you know, the intuition, the creativity, the insights that uh, people have. And the science part of it, you know, comes from the data itself and the statistics and uh, the optimization and the computing machinery that, that, uh, that goes beyond it. And it's a combination, you know, uh, that's where you can make two plus two equals five. Uh, um, and I've talked to uh, CEOs at many companies, and what I hear from them is, you know, it's the push has to come come from the top, right? When the if, when, once the top management team buys into this notion of, hey, you know, data are important and and, and analytics are key, then you know it's 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 much easier and faster for it uh, to to percolate it down. You know, here are some quotes that you see, you know, Gary Lumman. Uh, do we think or do we know? And you know, there are three ways of getting fired. One is to steal. Second is you know, harass women. And uh, third is if they put any practice in place without experimentation. Right? And that, that shows the value of you know, data and experiments. And you know, uh, at Sarah Lee, in God we trust others bring data. Jeff Bezos, we never throw away data. And the idea there is you know, among all of this data, there, is, there are insights that we can glean and, and, and how we can use it. So, um, you know, we might wonder, you know, I get this email. And the question is, why did I get this email? Right. What, how, did, how, did that, how, did, how did Express know to, to send that email to me? Right. And we'll uh, hold that thought in mind. Or, uh, you, know, why, you know, why did I see this? You know, here I am, you know, reading this news on Yahoo and, uh, you know, gas range and stuff, you know, uh, oven, you know, shows up. The question is, why did I get that banner ad? And, and I'll, I'll tell you the answer in, in, in a minute. Um, and, and so the idea behind data and marketing analytics is, you know, obviously it starts with data and 
we, you use this data to figure out, you know, something about the underlying behavior, right? Sometimes that behavior is about consumers or the end, end customers. So you try to estimate something about them. You try to estimate, for example, how price sensitive they are, right? That means if I change, if I increase my price by, you know, 100 rupees, you know, to what extent my demand will decrease or change, right? So that the, once you estimate those sensitivities, then you can use those to figure out the sweet spot for pricing. That's how, that's, that's my view of, of uh, data analytics starts with data. You estimate something and you try to, try to find the sweet spot of that. So it's, it's a combination of statistics and, and operations research, right? Operations research guys are really good at optimization stuff. Stats guys are really good at, good at estimation. And you, know, you need, you need uh, you know, a couple of different uh, capabilities in there. Right? And many companies are using it, uh, packaged goods firms, retailers, banks, insurance, Netflix, Amazon, uh, and so on. They're all you know, uh, leveraging these, uh, this, this process. Right? And, you know, and, 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 and uh, when you go to Amazon, check on a product, um, I mean, right now, you know, in our house in, in Hanover, New Hampshire, we're, we're you know, renovating the entire downstairs, breaking out walls and so on. And, and uh, uh, so we, we thought, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get all new appliances. And, and, and uh, someone sold, uh, told us that, you know, Electrolux, you know, gas range with the electric oven is a good one. So I went on to Amazon to, to check that. And now you see why CNN, when I was reading Yahoo News, suddenly, you know, the gas ranges banner ads were showing up. And, 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 and that's the reason, because I was, I was uh, I wanted a new appliance, and I went to, uh, went to yeah, Amazon, and uh, believe it or not, we actually bought a freaking gas stove and a, <laughs> an electric range from Amazon, you know, and, and, and it was free shipping. Uh, uh, um, so anyway, so you know, when, you, when you look at that one, Amazon gives you, you know, recommendations at the bottom. And the question is, you know, how does it do that, right? And uh, th that's, that, that's where, you know, more, this is where Excel, for example, fails. You know, Excel does sort of correlations, maybe some regressions, but I think you need more sophisticated tools to, to, to drive these insights. And one of the uh, engines that, that gets at these uh, recommendation systems are you know, Bayesian inferencing. And, and to put it in a nutshell, what it is, is you, know, you use you know, one million page visits, and you're trying to figure out or calculating the probability, you know, if I am viewing Electrolux, right, range, what is the probability of viewing a competing product, right? And from there you compute, you know, that means if, I, if, if, I, if a customer is looking at Electrolux, right, and to recommend a competing product, it computes the probability of viewing competing products for all the products, and then show those products where the probabilities are the highest, right? Making sense, right? And then that, that's sort of the, 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 the uh, 10,000 feet view of you know, how, how, they, how they come about. Now, um, this is the story you know, of, of Target. Target is a retail store in the United States, and it's, uh, it's one of the very early retailers to understand the power of data. They hired these uh, two or three PhDs in, in statistics, and all they've done is they look at you know, people's purchase behavior from their stores. right? And, uh, and, and the story actually came out in the New York Times. And what happened is they found out that you know, uh, women who are pregnant, for example, um, tend to buy a certain type of um, uh, body lotion and few other products. So they looked at the purchase behavior, and they actually rated each one of their millions of customers on a pregnancy index from 0 to 100. And not only that, they will even give you the due date. So there was this particular instance where they said, this particular per person in this household, their due date is August 28th. And so what they do is they, they come up with these things, and then they started, you know, because they also found out that, you know, uh, the, the, you know uh, uh, women who have, you know, who, who have young kids, they're very, they very brand and store loyal. They want to, st they want to buy the uh, things that they are used to. So it's a very profitable segment to go after. So they identified this, and they send out lots of brochures that are relevant for, uh, for, for pregnant women. And um, so actually the profitability, it was very profitable for them. And so one day um, a, a, a customer from a, in, a, in a local store, in a local store area was really mad and uh, he called the target store there and yelled at the branch manager 
uh, our store manager and said, what are you guys doing? You know, we have, I have an 18-year-old daughter in my house, and you guys are selling, selling me all these baby products and so on. You know, what, 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 what do you, you guys are crazy. Then the manager profusely apologized to, to, to this man and said, we are very sorry. You know, yeah, we have these statistics geeks who are talking about and all this stuff. I think our, our algorithm must have gone wrong. We're really sorry. And then actually he quick clicked on the computer. It says, it actually says, you know, uh, for, uh, there's a person there. The, the due date is August 28th. Right? So he got yelled at by this person, and then he in turn yelled at the statistics guys, you know, what are you guys doing here? And uh, a few weeks later, he gets a call back. He says, uh, it's, the, it's the father oh, who had called, yelled at him earlier. He said, hey, I'm really sorry I yelled at you last week. Um, it turns out that, that there were things going on in my household that I was not aware of. My daughter is expecting a baby on August 28th. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, this story came out in New York Times, and uh, you know people were uh, really mad at that, you know, in terms because of privacy issues and so on. So what what Target does now, it does all of that, but along with these, you know, baby products, pro ads to the baby products, you know, they also send brochures for, you know, um, uh, gardening equipment or snow shovels or tractors and so on, just just to throw them, just so you know they don't feel why they are getting these products. But they they say they do some decoy decoy stuff, and they know that it's decoy because their algorithm's still still working. Um, anyway, uh, where were we? Um, so so that, that's what I mean, in, in big data and, 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 and fast data, you have so, so much information floating around. You know, look at you know, uh, uh, 50,000 tweets every minute, and a lot of the products and brands and millions of customers, and so there's a huge amount of data. And uh, the McKenzie report says that if you stack all the information that we have, uh, digital information on CDs and stack all these CDs, you know, it goes 80,000 kilometers beyond, beyond the moon. So that's how much data that we have. Right? But, but, the, but the idea is, you know, the, the bottom line is, you know, it's key to figure out how to make sense of the data. First, let me tell you what doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, nobody that I know works at the most granular level of data. You know, it really doesn't make sense. No one really works at the granular level. Right? And uh, I mean, if you have all this data, you can generate millions of correlations, which is Excel is good at that. Right? But you know, there you might fall into the trap of epiphany, you know, trying to, which is you know, trying to find patterns uh, when none exist. Right? So what is, what is meaningful? What is meaningful is you, know, you have to Think of at some level of aggregation, right? Uh, because it then just makes it makes it easier. Second is you know being able to, if you have all this data, close your eyes and you got to be able to visualize the data as a flat file. When I say flat file, you have observations in the rows and variables in the columns, right? And that sort of forces you to think in terms of hey, what variables am I, or should I be interested in, right? And uh, you know, right now I'm working with, with data which has, you know, like 120 million observations. But, you know, it, 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 a, a, a simple server will not be able to handle that. So, but then we have the entire uh, field of statistics built on random sampling. And if, you know, because of random sampling, you don't have to look at the entire data. You know, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can randomly select and that way you can, it'll be, it'll be much faster, you know. Uh, and I'll talk more about that. And, 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 uh, and, and starting with, 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 with some theory is important, you know. Um, it, what should I expect, you know, what, what, what are some of the key variables? And theory becomes important as opposed to uh, randomly uh, jumping into the data and trying to find um, some random correlations. And once you have some theory, you can think about what kind of experiments that, uh, that, that we need to run, right? Um, so there are, there are many different types of data that are available. Uh, and, and different data are more suited for different types of analytics. Like, for example, if you're trying to figure out what's the best way to change customer behavior, right? Then a, a good way to do that is to do some field experiments, right? And having diff having a control condition and a few other treatment conditions, and and then look at what uh, uh, the output of that. Uh, if you want to, you know, um, predict your sales, for example, right? 
and uh, you know the sales are a function of factors that are under your control and factors that are not under your control. So that means you need to look at secondary data by census or other bureaus that collect this data and look at you know uh, and combine that with your sales and try to forecast that, right? Or if you're trying to look at you know trying to figure out how sensitive are my customers to my marketing mix, which is you know. Uh, pricing, advertising, promotion, distribution, and if you need something like that, you might need some type of a scanner panel data. Now, if you go to a you know, uh, grocery store, then you scan stuff. You know, as soon as you scan, all of that information is being captured, right? So, data of that type will help you figure out these these sensitivities. Um, if you want to figure out how do I enhance customer loyalty, then you need uh, you know loyalty card loyalty card data. And, and information of the, which is what Target was using in their in their study, right? If you want to try to figure out how to make optimal marketing mix decisions, how do I? What is the sweet spot for my spy, price? How much should I spend on advertising? Um, how much should I spend on promotion? Right? Then you need, can get you know store level scanner data, and you may also want to look at some competitor data as well, right? So, you know, with all of this data, and if you look at if you look at too far away from 20,000 feet, you know, it all looks, look out, it all, 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 everybody looks, looks the same, but only when you dig deeper and closer into the data and try to figure out who the various segments are, that's when you get insights and, 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 and the beauty of the data. And, and the idea of, of it is, you know, as, as Payless says, you know, you want to be able to predict the um, behavior of the, um, Customers or, or whatever the data uh, are based on, be let's say behavior of the customers, right? You want to be able to predict that and think about what will they do if you right now you're doing X and they're doing they're doing something else, but if you change it to Y, how does their behavior change? So the other phrase that you hear in this world is the notion of you know predictive models or predictive analytics, right? And that's what predictive analytics is about. Predictive analytics is you know how do I able to predict customer behavior so I can leverage that and go there where the ball is going to be, right? As opposed to a, just a linear trend line, right? Uh, so what I'm going to do is, um, in the next uh, half hour or so, I will uh, give you a sort of a brief overview of about six studies that, you know, I personally have been involved in through consulting engagement with, uh, engagements with companies and my, uh, my, my own research projects as well, trying to give you a feel for how do we leverage big data to make, uh, big, big, big data to make uh, better, better marketing decisions, trying to combine data and the, data and the analytics, right? So the, uh, the first one that, uh, is, is about, that I'm currently involved in, uh, this is with an um, uh, energy company in Austin, Texas where um, we have collected, uh, we have you know, about 120 million uh, observations. These are minute level electricity usage uh, by the customers of this energy company. Right? And you know, as you know, Austin, Texas, it gets pretty hot in the summer. And the idea there is, you know, how do we get to, how do you get people to reduce their electricity consumption in the peak months, which is you know typically uh, uh, July and uh, July and August, right? So we so we had a control group where we didn't do anything, and then they had you know uh, treatment groups, right? And there were five treatment groups. One of them, one of the groups is they get a text message saying, "Hey, you know, tomorrow is is will be your peak pricing day." Uh, another one will be a group where they install these Nest thermostats, which the thermostat is supposed to learn your uh, temperature control behavior and automatically adjust that, right? And uh, uh, one group was they, they have access to a portal and they can look at their, uh, look at their consumption behavior. Uh, one is a actionable text where uh, they tell them, hey, tomorrow will be peak, uh, elec peak electric pricing, uh, reduce your uh, air conditioning usage. And the last one is Pricing, that will tell them, hey look, tomorrow is uh, peak pricing, and by the way, your pricing will be higher by this amount. So they give you a specific price uh, that will be, that is higher than these. So these are the groups, and you're trying to see what is the best way to, to, to communicate to them, right? So again, you know, 
to, to run about over 100 million observations, you know, you probably need a mainframe with about one terabyte of memory. A typical server doesn't have that, so you know, to do it on, 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 on my server, server, we just randomly sample 17 million observations, then that cranks through within like a few minutes. So you do it multiple times just to make sure it works, right? And, uh, and this is what we find. So the, um, the area, the time frame between those two vertical lines is the treatment period. So here is an example of the, the people who just got the text message and, uh, and the control group. There is absolutely no difference in their electric consumption at all from the control group. Uh, that means sending it just a, if you look at typical uh, marketing uh, literature, you'll find that you know, any form of uh, uh, communication should work. A text message should work but get, you know, it doesn't work. And these are, you have millions of observations and you know, you, you, and that's what the data are trying to tell you. But so what works? Giving them price information works. If you send them a text and saying, hey look, you know, tomorrow your price is going to be higher from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. and give them the exact price information, there is a significantly lower usage. And they reduce their air conditioning usage. Right. And n none of the other groups, Nest, Thermostat, none of them really works. What this tells you is that, again, this is huge data. So you can't, you know, uh, this, this, is, this is what is happening, that just, you know, simply sending one message wouldn't work, you have to give them the pricing information. So here is, here is a way we, you know, leverage the big data to understand, you know, the consumer behavior and figure out what is the best, best form of communicating with them, right? Um, um, here is one in a, in a B2B context, I was working with a uh, large, um, billion dollar um, B2B company, and what they were interested in knowing is, you know, hey, we want to be able to predict our sales uh, so that we can better streamline our up upstream purchases and allocate our sales force uh, according to various segments and so on. And so in that context, now there, you know, in a B2B context, or even to a B2C, you know, the macroeconomic factors play a big role. Apart from their marketing uh, mixed variables, so we collected data on you know hundreds of factors. So that's why even you know just because you started the big data, I think it's good to think about what's the problem that we are trying to solve. Right? When you start with that question, then you would know what kind of data that you need to collect. Right? Uh, even though you have data, you know, going 80,000 kilometers beyond the moon, you know, most of, you know, 99% of that will be useless for you, right? Uh, so asking the right question here, our question was predicting sales, and we talked about, you know, what factors impact sales. We collected data on these hundreds of factors. Again, you know, that's also a huge amount of data, but, uh, and what you'll also find is, you know, a lot of it will be highly correlated as well, right? Then, I mean, if you, if you, if you this is a graph of their sales, right? and the other factors, and if you just look at that, you know, it, it, uh, you can't glean any meaningful insight out of it in terms of what drives what, right? So what we did was, well, you know, so when you have so many variables, you know, you have to reduce the data dimensionality, right? And you have techniques such as factor analysis that will help you reduce the dimensionality. Right? It will collapse these, you know, 100 or so variables into a more reasonable number of factors, maybe four or five or six, which is still much more easy to handle than these uh, hundreds of variables, right? And, and, and the factor analysis gives you those, the, the weights of each of these factors, and then you can leverage, you know, tools such as regression analysis to try to figure out how are my sales impacted by these factors, right? Again, this is where, you know, uh, tools such as Excel will sort of break down because they, they can't do factor analysis and cluster analysis and so on. You need, you need more sophisticated tools to do that, right? Um, and if we did that, and you see here that the um, uh, red line is the actual sales and the blue line is the, uh, is, is the predicted sales. And it's amazing to see, I mean, even I was amazed to see, man, you know, how to get this close. I mean, if you look at, you know, R square of predictor versus actual, it's really high. And I mean, from here, we got here. Right? 
So again, that's where you start with the theory, try to figure out, and there are tools to reduce that. And, and on the right hand, on the other side of the red line is an out-of-sample prediction. So you use the data before that to compute your weights, and then you go forward. And the company was really happy that we were able to you know, come pretty close to predicting their you know, sales or sales change uh, from month to month right? using, uh, uh, using previous data. Right? Um, moving on. I was involved in another project where, you know, uh, we were trying to, we were interested in, you know, how do price sensitivities change uh, across households? So we're trying to figure out, you know, uh, what type of households are more price sensitive, who are less price sensitive, and actually, is there any difference among those, right? And to be able to do that, then we have no choice but to have household level data, right? That means we need to make sure that this company has a pretty active loyalty card program, right? So with that, we can then keep track of the um, behavior of the, of the individuals or at the household level in their shopping habits, and that's where it is. This is the, you know, and, and uh, IRI and Nielsen are, are two big players here, and they collect these, uh, what we call as scanner panel data and track their purchases over time, right? Um, so, you know, Hundreds of panelists, two years. Um, this is the uh, cola category, and, and we're trying to figure out how do these sensitivities differ, right? Um, and you know that you know, 156,000 uh, shopping trips, um, and the the key variable of interest for us is which brand are they buying on their shopping trip, right? Which brand of cola? or do they buy nothing in that category, right? Uh, and, and so we, whether they are buying in the category or not, and if they buy, what brand would they choose, right? And so there are some drivers of that. The drivers are, of course, you know, brand loyalty. You know, if I bought something in the past, I tend to buy it in the, in the future, right? Um, the, the feature that is what is displayed, uh, the feature in the local newspaper, the pricing, and we looked at the perceived price gain. For example, if I'm used to buying Coke at uh, $1.99 for a six pack, right? But if I find it on sale at, let's say, you know, $1.49, you know, my perceived gain is 50 cents. On the other hand, if it is $2.49, you know, the perceived loss of 50 cents, right? So we have this psychological stuff in our minds and we behave differentially, right? So you, you, you put all of that, you know, and, and um, I don't want to bore you with the, with, with the mathematics of that, especially after lunch, so I'm gonna shift to the results. So he, these are, you know, price sensitivities across households. So what this graph shows is, you know, households differ in their price sensitivities. You know, they are not, they are not, they are all, they are all not a homogeneous group, right? So if people are differing in their price sensitivities, right, how should you think, should, should there be a, should there be one price for everybody or different prices for everybody? Pardon? Pardon? Different price, because pe people's price sensitivities are different, right? What that shows is that means, what does price sensitivity mean? That means people's willingness to pay is different. So that means if you really want to leverage that, that insight, then you ought to be able to price differently for different, different people. And now the technology of email and so on will help us do that. So even though we all see the same price for let's say Dell computer online, but the coupon that I get will be quite different from, you know, coupon that you guys get. So, when you go to the website, it's the same price, but we actually end up getting separate prices, right? That's the idea here, how do we separate these prices? And we leverage that and saying, when you do a price optimization with these household level parameters, you know, you can do better pricing and it leads to higher profitability, right? To the range of anywhere from, you know, 23% uh, to almost, you know, 52% relative to the current profitability. Right? And now we have the technology to sort of implement that. All right? Um, and here's a project I worked with, you know, uh, a, a hotel chain where they're trying to figure out how do we leverage their, you know, huge amounts of loyalty data to improve uh, customer loyalty and profitability. Right? So here you have a hotel chain. Again, loyalty card data, you have two years. Uh, thousands of members, 
and we sort of know what their uh, initial uh, tier status is. Usually they have you know what uh, regular uh, gold, diamond, platinum uh, tiers and uh, the, the, if you think of a loyalty program, there are two types of loyalty programs. One is if you stay at the hotel you know say five times or whatever x number of times, uh, the, the, the x plus one time will be free, right? That's called the frequency reward program. And then you have you know uh, tier status, gold, uh, diamond, and platinum, and at each tier you will have you know lots of benefits going forward for the next year, right? And and, and the reason you know I signed my life away to Delta Frequent Flyer program is because customer program because you know they treat me well and I like I, I like that you know as 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 a platinum member they really take good care of you, and so even if there is not a uh, non-stop flight, I would rather fly Delta because I would rather be something to somebody than, you know, nothing to everybody, right? So, and, and that's, you know, the firms are trying to realize that and, 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 and so here yeah, the question is, how do we sort of improve that, right? Uh, again, you have regular platinum diamond tiers. And here is what we found, you know, pretty interestingly that when people get closer, as they get closer to the, the reward, Let's say you know the hotel gives you stay with us six times, the seventh one is free, right? As you get closer to the sixth one, your purchase rate is actually increasing. So you are creating a trip which may not have existed. It means that trip is coming either from staying in a competing hotel or you are sort of on the fence, hey, should I go to this conference or not and stay at this hotel? Oh, yeah, if I go to conference, I get to stay at Sheraton. Oh, that means next time we'll be free, right? So if you look at this, that's what it's showing. Your, your purchase rate is, you know, closeness to, let's say, customer tier requirement. As you get closer, you, 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 you're increasing, which is what we call as a points pressure effect. So unless you have this big data from all these loyalty customers, you would not, we would not have been able to uh, uncover this uh, phenomenon. I mean, you know, there have been some experiments done, but empirically no one has really seen what exactly is that effect. So this is as you get closer to a tier. Let's say you are at, you are at, you're, you're, you're close to being a diamond, and, 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 and so on, and then you try to maybe fly with the airline a little more frequently than before, or you stay at the hotel you know, one extra time to, to get that, right? And, um, and the same thing that we find that uh, with frequency rewards also, as you get closer to that reward, you tend to uh, fly more frequently either with the airline or stay at the hotel more frequently, right? Again, we were able to uncover that by, by looking at the loyalty card data. And based on this information, that we went back and redesigned their uh, frequency reward program and the customer tier program and tried to find the sweet spot for these cutoff levels that will improve the revenues at this, at this hotel chain. Um, so in, here's a project that I'm in, involved with, uh, one of my co-authors, Sudhir here at ISB, that, you know, uh, and, 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 and we, 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 we both like beer, and we were just talking about world's number one beer, actually, a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, actually, there's an amazing website called beeradvocate.com, and that rates all the beers in the world um, on taste and, and so on and so forth. It's actually a fun, fun website to play around, and it rates all, all, all the beers that are available. Um, so the idea here is we, here we have you know, store level weekly data of uh, beer purchases at, at this retailer and uh, many 15 brands, 96 SKUs, you know, 56 stores. Um, and uh, we have a lot of data on their marketing mix, variables, pricing, promotion, uh, advertising, and so on. And the idea there is to first figure out you know, uh, how do people react to these prices, how sensitive, sensitive they are, and then figure out the uh, best prices for these, for these various brands of beer, right? Um, so again, the approach is going back to what I first showed you. Start with data, right? And then you are estimating something, you know? And in this case, what we are estimating is how price sensitive people are. You know, how sensitive are they to distribution? You know, uh, for example, if one uh, beer is, is, is not available, who, what do you switch to, right? How sensitive are you to advertising? You know, uh, do you like light beer or dark beer? Do you like can or do you, do you like bottle, 
right? Uh, and so on and so forth. And there are lots of these attributes. So that's the next step. You try to figure out how how people how sensitive people are to each of these each of these factors, right? But then we we don't stop there. We want to go back and say, you know, well, you know, how do we optimize these prices given these sensitivities, right? Um, competition plays a big role. You know, you have uh, a you know. Uh, beers are competing with the competitors are you know, there's the similarities among beers and there are differences right so we, we, we found out that competition is plays, a, is plays a key role so we, we capture the impact of impact of competition and um, then work forward to figure out the the optimization component right um, and uh, again in this case we, uh, you know, the, the, the current way of pricing was sort of more, more steady, and if you take all these complex interactions into consideration as a unit, you know, as a, as a retailer, you know, the retailer really doesn't care whether you buy Miller beer or Bud beer, right? Because, you know, their margins are pretty similar, right? So, if you think of it as a category profitability, that's probably the right way to think about it. Because at the end, what the retailer cares about is, what's my overall profitability in this entire category. So that means, you know, changing prices of Bud is going to impact the sales of Miller, right? And vice versa. So you want to look at these interactions and then optimally price, you know, Bud and Miller and the other brands together. Because at the end, that's what the retailer cares about, the overall profitability of the category, not just one brand or the other. If you did that, what that algorithm tells you is, well, you've got to play around with all these brands, and, uh, and, 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 and that leads to, you know, higher, higher profitability. All right. And, um, and the last one is, this is, uh, I was involved with a, with a large multi-billion dollar national retail chain, uh, chain and, and they're interested in two things. They're interested in, uh, you know, the, the uh, predicting the sales of, of each of their SKUs, and they're also interested in, well, how do I price optimally, right, each of these, uh, uh, each of their SKUs, right? So again, the, the analysis was, was, was exactly what I talked about, the other studies. It, in, it started with, you know, uh, data and, coming, and, and then estimating the uh, underlying sensitivities for each of these product at the SKU level, right, and then running some optimization. So it's, it's, it's a classic combination of statistics and optimization and store level data uh, and including competitors data, millions of daily transactions, uh, thousand stores, 1200 categories, one year million members, two year data. I mean, uh, it, it's, uh, the data is, is as big as it, as, um, as it can get, right? And you crank it through. Um, so the way I think, you know, here is my algorithm for, for, uh, for, for, for uh, doing this um, estimation and optimization. You start with the data. Here, this is, this is the key starting point. This is your data that comes from your sales and price zones and prices and all the information, right? And based on the data, you have some theory. You have some underlying demand model where, you know, sales is on the left-hand side and you have all the other variables that are impacting sales, right? That's your, that's your demand model that comes from your, you know, uh, it, it, that, that, you know, intuition and the science behind it tells you what should be the demand model. And the input to that will be competitors' prices, competitors' sales history and all of that, right? And so once you have, once you are, so you use this data and this data to estimate this demand model, and then you go to the optimization, and here you got to figure out what my strategic framework, you know, uh, what are my management goals, and what kind of, uh, prior heuristics that I've been using. Like for example, you might say, I want to have all SKUs of, let's say, uh, of Budweiser brand to have the same price. Let's say you had that heuristic, you can put that as a constraint, right? So you think of these as constraints, here are the goals and the objectives, and you sort of, based on this input, you optimize that, you, and then you come up with your optimal marketing decisions, right? And then you have somebody looking over that, that's where the, the people part of it comes in, you know, the, the, the um, uh, when I say art, the art part of it, you know, the, uh, the, your creativity and the insight and the experience comes in here. They prove it, they execute it, and then they look at the market reaction, and that goes into the computer system, and that begins your new data. So this, this algorithm gets updated every week as new data comes in. So your estimate gets better and get better and better as you go along, right? So we've done that and, and computed the, um, or, or came up with op, 
uh, optimal prices for you know 788 SKUs across 14 categories, right? Um, and but then the CEO asked as well, how do you how do we know this actually works, right? Yes, the computer is saying do all of this stuff, but he says how do how do I know it works? Well, they said well they said give us 42 stores, 21 of them. I will let your store managers do things the way they do. And in 21 of these stores, let us do what our system tells us to do, right? And then we'll see what happens, right? So across these, you know, and they, they let us do it for uh, 12 weeks, uh, three month period, 14 categories, the other number of SKUs that were optimized, about 500 of them, and there are all the observations, and, and we're trying to see whether it works or not, right? So, and the key performance metric, you know, the stores care about, you know, what they call as gross margin dollars. Per SKU, per week, how much am I making? Netting out the cost, right? That's a key performance metric. And so then we compared, after controlling for category characteristics and so on, how does the profitability, is the gross margin profitability of an optimized SKU is it significantly different? When I say significant, both statistically and managerially significant, right? Uh, from the control group. First, let's do the statistics part of it. Well, it shows that there is a 40.7 cents gain in gross margin dollars per SKU per week per store, which is statistically significant at, let's say, 1% significance, let's highly, highly significant. So 40.7 cents may not seem that big, but if you extrapolate it, you know, you have average margin increase per week, per SKU, per store, 40.7 cents. Number of SKUs, 10,000, multiply that, you know, let's say percent of SKUs where margin improvement realized, 74%, so you have average improvement per week, per store is about $3,000, and number of weeks is 52. Let's say only half of those weeks you realize that, so that means margin improvement per store per year, 78,000, they have 100 stores, quickly become 7.8 million, which becomes suddenly a very significant number in a category where, you know, margins are, incremental margins are, are hard to combine, right? And, and that's how the, this, this company now has installed na nationally uh, this uh, uh, pricing algorithm for all their SKUs, right? So uh, I, I think, you know, the way I feel right now, I think the planets are all aligned for, for leveraging this big data and analytics. We have powerful ID sector, uh, particularly in India. Uh, in fact, a lot of these, you know, uh, background processes for these pricing companies are actually run from uh, in Bangalore. Um, there's a data critical mass, there is, you know, skill sufficiency, and there is an organizational need. And um, so my, based on all these studies, my conclusion is that, you know, Properly leveraging big data does improve the bottom line. I think it's time for me to shut up and ask you to ask me some questions. Thank you. Thoughts, comments, questions? Anyone? Yeah. How do you source this data? The analytics and the Okay, the question is, how do you source this data, correct? How do you get this data, right? Well, great question. So that's why, you know, I, I, let me speak on the retail side, for example. That's why once they install these retail scanners, right, and even though it was, it was done as a matter of convenience, so as soon as something is scanned, all this data are recorded. So the retail side, you know, scanners are, are a great way to start sorting the data. Second way is, you know, loyalty cards. Right? Having those loyalty, I tell you the reason I will only, I, I buy, I, I, if you think about buying books from Amazon.com versus Barnes and Noble, I have no incentive to go to Barnes and Noble because Amazon knows a lot more about my own behavior than I know myself. Right? It's, it's actually, it's crazy how much they know, but they know so much that I, I can blindly go, they recommend stuff and you know, but they've invested in that, you know, data source and technology. So you need to have a proper loyalty card mechanism or some scanning mechanism or some historical you know, uh, uh, in information that, that you can want to keep track of. Yeah. I had a question here. Yeah. So uh, can you talk about any tools or frameworks that you use to do your analysis? Uh, tools and frameworks, in terms of framework, you know, the one that I... 
this is this is this is this is what I live by. You know, this is my framework. All right. And in some cases, you may not have all the data to implement this framework, right? Uh, but I, 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 I tried this to be the guiding light in terms of, you know, where is the data coming from? What's my demand model? And what, what am I optimizing? Right. Okay. So have you written like custom algorithms or how do you actually analyze have, yeah. the data? I have, yeah. I've, I've written custom algorithms in, 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 in Fortran, C++, and, you know, Mathematica, um, and, and so on. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Not a separate question, but just adding on to that. Uh, the slides that you uh, showed on the weighting, weighing the parameters, and huh? then uh, you know, and then fact clustering, factoring, etc. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, so these, you know, coming from uh, moving from that first slide to the second slide, uh -huh. from this one to that one, I, I just wanted to know: is, is this done through the standard functionalities that you will get in a you know in an analytics uh, software like r or sas or is it something customized because right. this is very impressive i mean I'm yeah no it's pretty standard i used uh, i actually used sas for this again sas is the other one that i use sas it's pretty sophisticated one you know and and most of the stuff that you do in sas apparently i believe it's available in r i have not done r but my colleague is an expert in r but okay. it's, avail so it's available. That's what I wanted to check. Yeah, these are available in R, but SAS is something, SAS is what I used to do this one. Okay. Uh, Dr. Praveen, uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the great lecture. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a small technical question. Uh, recently, in analytics, there is a big discussion that is going on around applying even our normal distribution theorems in terms of marketing analytics. So people are kind of quite Right. In, in recent past, they are of the opinion that we should move from normal distribution to L-shaped distribution. And especially in terms of big data, there is a big impact of outliers or what we call black swan in the language of Nicholas Nassim Taleb. So how do you really deal with this two kind of phenomena that is emerging in marketing? Great, great question. And, and so, you know, simply because of that, now I'm, you know, for, for a long time, I've been a very classic classical statistician that I believe that, you know, there is a... Uh, unknown mean and an unknown variance, you know, and these parameters are drawn from normal distribution and so on. But slowly, you know, I think, you know, the, the, I'm, 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 I'm uncovering or learning the power of Bayesian techniques and non-parametric techniques where you don't have to make any distribution assumption about the underlying parameters and be agnostic and let the data tell you what the distribution might be. So that's a newer Bayesian, you know, inferencing techniques which gets away from the kinds of assumptions that you're talking about. Right. And what right. about outliers? How do you normally deal with outliers? in terms of the data? Oh, the, 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 you know, what I do is, you know, at the end of the day, outliers, you know, what are outliers? Outliers are also part of the data, right? And, and uh, you know, if you want to look at outliers, what I do is I run my model both with the outliers and without the outliers and see what the freaking difference is going to make. If it's really making a difference, I want to look at those outliers more closely and see what is it about it that they are, they are moving that and are they re is that really random or is it, is it part of the data distribution? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hi. Uh, would like to understand uh, any case study with your online uh, data in terms of the analytics part of it on the online side of it. Uh, okay. If you have, I mean, most of it were uh, on the offline, uh, social, uh, digital web trends on the site, uh, what kind of behavior data and what kind of analytics and how people are looking into it. Great, great question. No, the case that I have I've shown you, you know, I didn't show the online stuff, but some of the more ongoing stuff you had, you know, the uh, on, the, see online there's a lot going on. You know, one thing you can start looking at it is, you know, uh, uh, what kinds of things people are, people like and not like, and the reviews and so on. You can look at what is the impact of these reviews on your on your on your sales online. But again, it's still data, and try to visualize that in terms of you know these are all these ratings, they are all your sales. How are they being impacted? And they do find there is a significant effect of these likes and dislikes and the reviews on your sales. Right. Yeah. So in terms of uh, if you look into the time horizons, whatever you've done across, that has got quite a lot of history. Right. Uh, online, the period would be very less in terms of working right. and getting period that. Period would be less, uh, but the number of people are more. Right. So your you know, observation becomes the person and not the time, and not, time becomes less of an issue. Sure. Thanks. One question, Professor.